With the two job quest stories being completed, I think it's time we move on to the role quests in Endwalker, specifically the tank role quest. I think it's precedent that I should place a spoiler warning here. The role quests occur in the story because of something that happens in Endwalker's main scenario. If you don't want to be spoiled on that specific something, then don't continue. Okay, we good? So around the midway point of the story, we defeat Zodiac and learn that his defeat is actually a bad thing for the realms. He was summoned to hold back the final days, which was using the power of Dynamis, a type of emotion-driven energy. We returned from the moon, back to Hydaelyn, and Thavnir was in despair. Anyone who felt any sort of overwhelming emotion would have their aether start to rot, and their physical form would disappear, turning them into hulking monsters that are known as blasphemies. It was a pandemic. Your mother despairs over seeing her husband slain, which in turn turns her into a blasphemy. Her children are unable to comprehend what just happened. They too feel the despair and turn into blasphemies. It was a never-ending cycle until we stepped in with all the scions at our backs. We started to get it under control. At first, it seemed like the final days only hit Thavnir, but when we contact the representatives of Eorzea, who were based in Razat Han, it seems like the final days has hit everyone, just not as severe as Thavnir. So as I said before, this will be the tank roll quest. The city-state that needs saving is Gridania. Remember, if you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't give it a thumbs down, consider subscribing if you enjoyed the content and are interested in more content like this. Doing this helps the channel greatly and lets me know if you guys actually enjoy these videos or not. Anyway, enough delay. Let's start the video. Our journey begins in Razat Han. We speak to a Twin Adder representative who tells us that Gridania is in need of our aid. They want us to travel there with haste. The final days has come. We are experienced in dealing with it, so our knowledge of the blasphemies would be greatly appreciated. We won't let our allies of the Twin Adder down, and make way for Gridania. We speak to a guard who goes and alerts Kane Senna to our arrival. She is accompanied by the Keeper of the Entwined Serpents. She thanks us on behalf of Gridania for coming to their aid, but we must skip any formalities. She will share what they know about their elusive prey. After the events in Thavnir, a man fell into fits on the road before transforming into a blasphemy. Eyewitness accounts tell of the subsequent attacks. It had patterns on its skin, which looked like chains. For that reason, they have decided to call it Glefnir, a creature of legend. In Norse mythology, Glefnir is said to be a rope that binds Fenrir. It will hold until Ragnarok occurs, in which time he will break free and devour Odin. The Glefnir in our story is most likely reminiscent of Fenrir breaking free from his chains, as he has chain markings all over his skin. Quite the interesting comparison, if I'm honest. Glefnir is elusive. He awaits in the brushes for a ripe time to attack. Whenever they try to respond to attack, they are left no trace to follow. Even the elementals want it dealt with, but we are unsure if we could even beat such a creature if we confronted it. The people who are injured by Glefnir are left afflicted. His attacks are imbued with a strong poison. The tiniest of scratches will leave you for dead. His poison is reminiscent of the creeping death. Many years ago, a plague swept through the Twelvewood. It caused chain-like patterns to appear on their skin. The afflicted spent their last moments in agony. It spared no cure its blight. They were nearly wiped out until they created a cure from Glimshroom. The scars of this past has just begun to heal, but Glefnir threatens to reopen old wounds. Both white magic and Conjury are ineffective in stopping the poison. To confront Glefnir would risk too much for their soldiers. Our conversation is interrupted as the Keeper is contacted and told that Glefnir is attacked once again in the North Shroud. They are unable to track him, but a man who was attacked is still alive. We should try to question him for any sort of information on the beast before he succumbs to the poison. At the North Shroud, we speak to a twin adder sergeant named Aethelmere, who tells us the man is currently being held outside the bobbing cork. He is being attended by a healer, but it may be beyond his capabilities. Luckily, Kane Senna is here, as she is known for her mastery of white magic. The healer has done the best he could. He has healed the wounds, but the poison still lingers. The chain-like patterns is indeed appearing on his chest. If the creeping death has returned, then he has done all he can. But Kane Senna will take over for now. He should rest. Shouting is heard from the east gate of Full Gord's float. There is a swarm of Chigos. They are mosquito-like creatures that are known for carrying the creeping death. The people are already on edge. If they think that the plague is returned, then there would be panic. The Chigos are located near the Alder Springs. So we head there and slay them, avoiding being bitten lest they actually carry some form of the plague. We rescue a merchant from the Chigos. He is carrying a cure for the creeping death. He is brave enough to admit that he saw profit in the people's suffering at Full Gourd Float, 
but that prophet is no good to him if he dies. Instead, he allows us to take the cure from him for free, as a token of thanks for saving his life. We are carrying the only hope for this man in our hands. Let's hope it works. We bring it to Kane Senna. She administers the cure to him. He keeps groaning in pain. Just hold on a little longer. Once the cure goes through his body, the pain should subside. But the man keeps wriggling violently. His shrieks become louder and louder until eventually it falls silent. We failed to save this man. May the Twelve have mercy on his soul. It seems like the cure doesn't work for the poison. We need to get an understanding of our foe's abilities, otherwise more people will succumb to their ailments just as he has. Glefnir's poison is more potent than even the Creeping Death was. Even though they resemble one another, they do not share anything else in common. His death was a tragedy, but it did provide us with information. The people can rest easy, knowing that the Creeping Death has not returned. It cannot be administered by the Chigos or the like, only from coming in contact with Glefnir. We must spread the word, so hope may yet live. If people fall into despair, then more blasphemies like Glefnir will be born. We say one final prayer for the man, and return to the Adder's Nest. We must find Glefnir's whereabouts. They are currently compiling all known locations where Glefnir is struck. Accumulating all that information leads us to believe that Glefnir is most active in the South Shroud. We must make our way there as soon as possible, lest we miss this chance to apprehend Glefnir. Even Kane is left for Rootstake. Let's not keep her waiting. We rendezvous with Khan A near Camp Tranquil. We need to learn a thing or two about the threat so we can use it in our search. Luckily, Rhea O Senna comes to Camp Tranquil often. Her knowledge should prove quite useful. We speak to Rhea O and she's being accompanied by two Moogles. Every moment we stay idle is crucial. Does she have any information on Glefnir? It recently ambushed a traveler who died to his wound not too long after. The people of Camp Tranquil are afraid to leave as they feel a malicious presence is lurking in the distant trees, ever watching. The people are restless. If Glefnir decided to attack the camp directly, there would be devastating losses. Just one scratch could kill you. Rhea O doesn't know what to do, and the people can see that she is at a loss. The atmosphere is getting tense, and sometimes even accuse her of doing nothing whilst the blasphemy runs free. She's doing all she can. Kane is apologetic. Maybe if she had come sooner, Rhea wouldn't have to bear this burden alone. But these burdens aren't just for Kane to bear too. We should share the weight of this burden together. In fact, we should enlist the help of the elementals. Under a different circumstance, Kane agrees that that would be the best course of action. But ever since the calamity, their power wanes and she doesn't want to impose on them. She also shudders at the thought of hearing the elementals distress. Instead, she proposes that we should speak to the people of Camp Tranquil to reassure them that everything will be okay. As for Rhea O, she should reach out to Aru. Together, they should be able to offer that same reassurance to the elementals. Kane wants us to come along with her. When the people see that she is being accompanied by the Warrior of Light, then the people may believe her claims. At first, we overhear a man speaking ill about the Seed Seers. The Seed Seers will be sitting pretty whilst this beast runs amok and hunts them. You'd be a fool to trust them with our lives. It's time we move to Uldar. At least they don't pretend to look out for their common folk. Unbeknownst to him, Kane is standing right behind him, hearing his every word. When he notices her, he starts staggering his words. She ignores his words and instead tries to console him. She promises that she is sparing no effort in the hunt for Glefnir, but more time is required. In the meantime, she wants the people to place their faith in her. She loves the Twelveswood and her people with all of her heart and will not allow the beast to torment them any longer. The man looks towards his wife and then back to Kane. He understands what she is saying. Truly, he doesn't want to abandon his home. He will stick around for now. The second villager is afraid of the beast. Only one scratch and you're doomed. But Kane tells her to not fall into despair. She will do all in her power to see them through this crisis. The woman is surprised to see Kane here. It means a lot to her for Kane to leave the safety of her walls and place herself at risk by coming here in Camp Tranquil. The final villager is a man who claims he saw a gigantic beast stalking the woods. What stops it from coming here to fill its belly? Kane tells the man that Glefnir would not do such a thing, and even if it tried, she wouldn't allow it to step a mom within the village. Keep heart, for brighter days lie ahead of us. After hearing those words, the man calms down and calls her a beacon of light in these dark times. The villagers' unrest seems to be quelled, so we return to the Keeper. Though their unrest is gone, until Glefnir is no more, they won't be able to rest easy. 
but we have learned that sometimes just lending an ear does wonders. Mayhap we should do the same for the elementals. Kane wants to visit these settlements more often. The people probably relate to her being as distant as the elementals. She hates to impose on our goodwill, but she cannot stop her search until Glefnir has been laid low. The Keeper says it's no imposition. Ever since she saved his life from the fields of Kartanu, his life has been hers. His life is his own to control, but his conviction fills her with confidence that the path she walks is true, even if that path is far away. She starts to reminisce on the past. When she was still a student, she used to sneak away into the forest with a dear friend of hers. There is a part of her that still wants to wander where she isn't allowed. Our conversation is interrupted by Landonil, one of the ex-company of heroes who slew Titan and Leviathan. As he has word from the border, the roads were closed whilst they searched for Glefnir, but now there is a group of locals who demand to be let through into Thanalan. Despair grips their heart. We must go and speak to them, lest we have more blasphemies to deal with. We move south of Camp Tranquil, to the border between Thanalan and the Black Shroud. Just as Landonil said, there is a group of locals shouting at the guards, demanding that they be let through. Whilst they sit here idly, the creeping death eats at their heels. The guard tries to calm them down. Those rumors are false. The Elder Seedseer has claimed them to be so. Do not surrender to panic. Return to your homes whilst we deal with the threat, and do not listen to any baseless stories. But the man isn't having any of it. Stories! I've seen the dead with my own eyes. Don't tell me what is true and what isn't. Kane steps in. Listen to her words. The creeping death has not returned. Those who perished were ailed by a beast named Glefnir. Seek shelter in your homes until the threat has passed. The man claims to have seen Glefnir not too far from here. Glistening horns, terrible chains that reach out to drag you down to the seventh hell. They ran and never looked back. His recount of the beast does sound like Glefnir, but he reassures them that they didn't get hurt, so they're all okay, right? A different man from the back of the group speaks up. Let's say you weren't quite fast enough. What then? Well, it stores its poison in its horns and claws. A single scratch is enough to spell doom. The man starts staggering. His posture is strange. He is hunched over whilst grabbing his right arm. Even a little scratch, huh? Then, it's too late for me. Is that why my body feels like it's on fire? The other man shouts, You told me the branches tripped you up. You said that's how it happened. You said... Kane rushes forward and casts white magic on him. But it's ineffective. I don't feel any better. Do it again. Do it again. It hurts. Help me. If Kondri has no effect, then it is definitely Glefnir's doing. But he mustn't lose heart. He must stay strong. But he ignores her words. No, I don't want to die. Please, help me. He starts to stagger forward, but suddenly he screams out in agony. His aether starts to rot and decay away into this black residue before all that remains is a blasphemy. The other man starts to despair upon seeing his friend turned into a blasphemy. You said... You said it wasn't. Why? Why? Liar. Liars. You're all liars. None of us are safe. None of us will. He starts to scream in agony. Just as before, his aether rots until all that is left behind is a blasphemy. This is Kane's first time seeing a blasphemy. Despair made manifest. Is there nothing that can be done for these two poor souls? We shake our head. Then we can only slay them and put them to rest. With the help of Kane and the Keeper, we put the blasphemies to rest. May the Twelve have mercy on their souls. Kane blames herself for what just happened. She was powerless, again, harboring all this burden as if it was only hers to bear. We too, were powerless to prevent it. The survivors are worried. Is this what will happen to them? Then there is no hope. But Kane reassures them that what happened to them is because despair consumed their heart. Do not lose hope. We swore to defeat the blasphemy that plagues these lands. Have faith and look towards the horizon. Brighter days will come. The villagers will do as she says and return home. Whilst Glefnir still exists, despair will forever loom. The people will struggle to believe any words of comfort until he is gone. Tragedies like this one will occur more often. Even the elementals cry out for a solution. I think it's time we do what Rhea O said and commune with them. To do so, she will seek an audience with the Great One, but she must make some preparations. In the meantime, we should return to the Adder's Nest. Despite our best efforts, we have been unable to prevent needless deaths, but the words of Kane remind us to remain undaunted 
in the face of despair. After some time, Kane has finished her preparations for communing with the Great One. The situation has gotten worse, Glefnir grows more bald with each passing day, and the victims are untreatable. There is no known cure to the poison Glefnir has. Suddenly, he receives word that a bunch of woodwallers are currently attacking Glefnir near the Guardian Tree, which is where the Great One resides. With it there, it will prevent any and all communication with the Elementals. We cannot let it harm the tree. Kane has already left and asked that we rendezvous with her at Sorel Haven. We arrive at the destination, but there is no trace of man, nor blasphemy. Only battered arms and armor are strewn across the floor. We are then ambushed by two blasphemies. After defeating them, we start inspecting the arms again. Kane and the Keeper start running towards us. It seems like the Woodwallers fell into despair and had their aether rot, turning them into blasphemies. That's why there are no sign of their bodies, just their weapons and armor laying upon the floor. When confronted with certain death, they must have succumbed to their despair. Kane has a plan. She wants us to split up into groups to find the rest of the turned Woodwallers. After our search, we will regroup under the Guardian Tree. We search three different areas, each time finding a blasphemy and putting them to rest. We await our friends under the Guardian Tree. Our friends arrive. It is tragic that we had to put down so many brave souls, but we can take comfort in the fact that they are now at peace and the tree is safe. But now we hope the Great One will listen to our plea. Kane walks towards the tree and starts to commune with it, but suddenly she falls down in pain. The Great One is filled with an all-consuming fear. It told her to drive the evil away. The Great One is so overwhelmed by fear, it cannot provide us with the aid we need. Not until we defeat Glefnir. Suddenly we can feel a presence. Something is watching us. We are not alone. A gigantic, hulking beast jumps out from the shadows. Its claws are sharp. There are chains along its body. And it has one gigantic horn. It delivers a roar that rattles us to our very core. There is no mistake. This is the blasphemy that has thrown all of the Twelveswood into despair. Glefnir. It starts running towards us at full sprint. It makes way for the Guardian Tree. Kane puts up a barrier to stop the beast in its tracks. At first it works, but it forces its horn through the barrier. She tries to reinforce it, but it seems to not work. She must avoid the horn at all cost, lest she fall ill from the poison. Glefnir works up the strength and shatters the barrier, sending the rest of us flying backwards. We are the first to get up onto our feet. We stand in front of the Guardian Tree and our friends. Glefnir lifts up its entire body by just its hind legs, revealing the gigantic mass of muscle this creature truly is. He is preparing to strike us, but suddenly our echo starts to activate. No, not now. In this vision, we see two young Pajo being taught by their teacher, I Sumi Yan, the current guildmaster of the Conjurer's Guild. He is mid-lecture. In accordance with our covenant, the Pajo have been blessed by the elementals. The moment they are chosen, they will act as a mediator between man and nature. The most skilled Pajal are named Seedseers. It is their duty to guide Gridania. Both the students have potential to be Seedseers. After the lecture, we see the two Pajal children talking whilst under a tree. The girl complains that she doesn't want to be a Seedseer, not even a Pajal. She didn't ask for any of this. She is cursed with a different life where she doesn't age and has ugly horns. The boy likes the horns. Maybe they didn't choose to be this way but it shouldn't make them that different from others. It is not a curse, but a blessing. You can use it to help others, and we should. Do not give up on becoming a seed seer, Kane. We'd all be worse for it. She looks to the floor. A blessing. I never thought about it that way. I just didn't like not having a choice. But he's right. The vision ends here. We return back to the original scene, with Glefnir standing on its hind legs. It looks towards Kane and says her name before putting its forelegs to the ground and retreating. The Keeper wakes up from the blast, but Kane is still down. We rush to her. She's currently unconscious but unharmed. Glefnir did not reach her, and therefore hasn't administered the poison. Still, we cannot heal her here, and she should be brought back to Gridania. We will wait for him at the Adder's Nest. Kane has been successfully delivered to Isumiyan's care. She has already regained consciousness, but is not allowed visitors. The Keeper looks to the floor and vents his frustration. He was useless. He couldn't do anything whilst Kane faced Glefnir alone. He was to be her shield, but her falling unconscious is a testament to his failure. We tried to console him by saying she wouldn't have wanted him to throw his life away. After hearing our words, 
he seems to be a bit better. We truly are the hero that the bards sing of. We have suffered terrible trials, but we still stand, tall and resolute. He thanks us for the counsel. He almost forgot his lessons of the past. He doesn't like to speak of his past as it brings him shame to recall it. He fought at the Cartanu Flats on the day of the seventh Umbral Calamity. But he didn't fight as an Eorzean soldier, but as a Garlean conscript. He was clad in armor and magitech. You start to become numb to the violence when it becomes routine. You work to earn your next meal. Then the moon shattered and Bahamut emerged. When the dust had settled, he was just another body clinging to life among the fallen. He was staring at the sun, wondering if the heat would kill him or an Eorzean's blade would finish him off. It wasn't death that came, but salvation. Kane retrieved him and saved him from his fate. She saved the man who slew her own people. After his wounds were healed, she welcomed him to Gridania. She never regarded him with distrust, nor made him feel like he had to repay the debt he had to her. She fights not to take life, but to safeguard it. Through their friendship, she saw the wisdom in that distinction. He pledged his remaining years to her service. Nothing would have been accomplished if he threw himself at Glethnir. Even if they could profit from his sacrifice, she wouldn't allow it. Our words reminded him of this. We will defeat the blasphemy without forsaking those we hold dear. Eventually, Kane has grown strong enough that they are allowing visitors. We meet the Keeper at Stillgate Fane. Kane comes out with Yi Sum Yan. The Conjurer found no trace of the poison in her, so if we are ready, she'd like to continue our search for Glefnir. Yi Sumi stops her from leaving. Maybe we are ready, but she is not. It is one thing to talk, but it is another to go hunting for a blasphemy. The wounds that are visible are healed, yes, but he worries about the strain from the communion with the Great One. It could have taken a toll on her in a way we can't perceive. The Great One is a being of pure aether. She was exposed to its raw terror. There may be consequences. Kane is aware of the consequences, but she cannot sit idle as the blasphemy continues to kill her people. Her duties cannot continue while she is locked up here, but it's her duties that demand she stay. What happens if she were to fall in battle? Gradrania would be lost without her guiding light to bear the way. She should rest, gather her strength, so when the time comes, she is fit and well to do what must be done. For now, she should trust in her allies. Kane concedes. He is right. She will do as he says, but she doesn't see a reason she cannot plan the next step. Isumi gives her permission to do so. Our encounter with Glefnir has made it clear that we cannot beat it as we are now. Only with the power of the Great One can we be a certain of victory. When the Seventh Umbral Calamity happened, the Great One expended some of its power to create a barrier which spared the Twelveswood from the worst. If we could get it to do it again, we would not need to fear its poison. Therefore, we should put all our effort into appeasing the Elementals, to earn their favor. We must make the Great One hear our good intentions, to remind it that we do what we do for the salvation of the Twelveswood. The Keeper chimes in. We would gain a lot from trying to understand what drives Glefnir. It bears a resentment to the Elementals. Why? Lingering memories of the person Glefnir once was may be influencing its actions. The cases at Raz at hand backs up this theory. If you could figure out the original identity of this blasphemy, then you could figure out its motives. But where would one begin? Luckily for them, our echo connected with the beast and showed us a memory of its past. One that had Kane as a child in it. Both Kane and Isumi should be aware of who this is. His name is Ie Sura Supin. He was a Padjo who had no parents and instead dedicated all of his time to his studies. He embraced the role of Padjo and was a better student than Kane ever was. Even her teacher agrees. She never took to his lessons as much as him. She always dreamed about the outside world. She didn't want to be a Padjo. She wanted to live among the others. But Ie Sura was a pillar of constant support. Through his encouragement, she embraced her destiny and used her gifts for the greater good. They were to become seed seers together until that fateful day. One day they were out gathering herbs and they came across a stranger in the forest. He asked them to show him where the Great One resided so he could pray for his child's safety. Kane denied him, but Iesura couldn't leave a stranger behind and showed him to the Great One. Kane ran to Isumiyan and together they went to the Guardian Tree. In front of the tree lay the bodies of the man and Iesura. Iesura was alive, but the man died from the Great One's rage. When Iesura recovered, he told them what happened. The man was an adventurer who seeked wealth and glory. He came to steal a branch from the Guardian Tree. Iesura was still immature and unaware of the darkness that resided within man's heart. But the Great One made him pay a dear price. The Great One stripped him of his horns and with it the right to call him Padjol. 
Izumi was forced to expel him from the Fane. After that, he never saw him again. To think that he stayed within the Twelve's Wood this entire time. He dreamed of becoming a Seed Seer, a life of service to the people in the forest, but he was deprived of that purpose by the very same elementals he loved. But he did not lose the will to serve. He may have stayed resolved to watch over the Twelve's Wood in his own way. It's hard to imagine what could have caused him to turn into Glefnir, as if his life wasn't hard enough as it is. Isumi reveals that in their final conversation, Isura was going to speak to the Mughals to find a way to calm the Great One's rage and earn absolution. The Mughals have lived within the Twelveswood for longer than any other. They may have knowledge over its more inner workings. In that case, she wants us to travel to the Bramble Patch. Even if they don't know of Isura, their knowledge could help us in other ways. We speak to Pakwa Pika, a Moogle of the Bramble Patch. He recognizes us as the warrior who beat Moogle's guard. It's an honor to meet us. What brings us to the Twelves Wood? We tell him why we're here. What a coincidence. We were just discussing how we should go about calming the elementals too. The blasphemy has them on edge. Its corruption has spread throughout all of the woods. Rea O suggested to them to scour the forest for any taint and cleanse it before it gets out of hand. Koop de Koop enters the conversation. He is one of the Moogle's guard. He remembers us but isn't one for a rematch. Rea O actually cleansed them of their tempering. No more calling upon good King Mogomog the Twelfth for them. May he ever remain unsummoned in his royal grace and splendor. Pokoa asks us to assist them in finding this taint in the forest. We may have an eye for finding it. Let's start by moving to higher ground to survey the area easily. Without realizing, Pokoa flies into the sky without us, forgetting that we do not have wings. Either way, we scour the area from the sky with the help of our trusty steed. We spot a taint to the south. We defeat the tainted sprite and cleanse the area. The area is now clear. The others must be doing the same around the forest. The Great One would be applauding our efforts. Coop de Coop joins our conversation. Sadly, whenever we defeat the taint, it seems that two more take its place. The forest's natural ability to heal itself is waning, and this disease is spreading fast, too fast for the Moogles to handle. We need to come up with a better solution. We need to help the forest remember how to help itself. We must perform. The friending. What in the good King Mogul Mog the Twelfth? May he ever shower us with love and compassion in Koopa Nuts, is that? To be honest, Koop de Koop doesn't remember entirely. He doesn't even know its name. It's just something he came up with on the spot. In short, it's an old ceremony first performed by the people who wanted to settle in the Twelveswood. To establish a home, they had to gain the Elemental's permission. So a mage found and cleansed a few sources of foul aether, then planted saplings in their place and consecrated the soil with a prayer to show the forest the purity of their intentions. The Elementals were so taken by the mage's display that not only did they permit his people to settle in the Twelveswood, they also bestowed a blessing to him as proof of their covenant. The Gradanians still honor this agreement today. Any time a tree is cut, a sapling is planted. If we try to follow history's example, then we can help heal the forest's pain, but also nourish it with new life. The mage who performed this ritual was none other than Joran Lightheart, the founder of Gradania, the creator of the Conjurer Discipline, and the father of the very first Pajo named Aihuhuk Pota. Ever since then, the Elementals would bless a select few hers with horns, favoring them with their fellowship. The Pajo were exalted by all the people of Twelveswood. Even the Mughals look upon them with awe. We are lost in thought. Pukwa asks what we are thinking about. See, the thing is, Glefna may be a Pajo, or at least a former Pajo. He was a Pajo who was stripped of his blessing, and now this blasphemy kills with a poison that manifests symptoms that resemble the creeping death. Koop de Koop pities Iesura. To love the elementals, only to be shunned by them. To be surrounded by the beauty of the Twelveswood, and know that he was forever an outsider. All for a child's mistake. That despair could have easily caused him to turn, and his poison affects the people who bear the Twelveswood's blessing. This could truly be another manifestation of his despair. It explains the elementals' unease. Then we need to double our efforts. First we must gather as many saplings as possible. They want us to wait in the adder's nest and prepare ourselves for a long back-breaking day. Eventually Pukwa arrives to the adder's nest, along with all the saplings they have cultivated in their gardens. The hardest part is done, and now we will have the easy part. We get to find the taints and cleanse them, then place a sapling where the taint once lay. If we do it enough, the Great One should understand we are doing all we can to treat the forest. The Mughals will take to the east shroud. We will take the rest of them. Kane joins our conversation. Isumi has grown tired of trying to detain her any further. She will take the saplings and consecrate them. With a blessing from the Elder Seed Seer, it should speed their growth. Just as Jorin did before her, she shall approach the Great One in friendship. May it see through the veil of fear that blinds it and remember the covenant. We will start at the Central Shroud, specifically near Green Tier. 
the flow of aether there has become warped. We arrive to find some corrupted air. We slay the taint that comes from it. Kane walks to where the taint once was and says a prayer. In gratitude for your boundless blessing do I offer this gift. May it nourish you as you nourish us. Then she plants the sapling. We will now make way for the silent arbor. Again, something foul impedes the flow of aether. Again we find the taint, slay the corruption that seeps from it. Kane walks towards it, says her prayer and plants a sapling. Our next destination is to the north, to Hearst Mill. The corruption here is faint, so there isn't a need for us to fight anything. A prayer will be enough to cleanse it. Once the corruption is gone, she plants the sapling. With that, there are no more etheric disruptions. It seems the Mughals have already finished off the remainder of the corruptions. We aren't sure if it will appease the Great One, but we will know once we go to the Guardian Tree. A Hearst Mill woodcutter walks up to us and questions what the Elder Seed Seer is doing here. The corruption has upset the balance in the Twelves Wood. We are cleansing that corruption with prayer and saplings. So we've just been planting trees. Yes, we have. The Elementals have suffered, and with these offerings we will raise their spirits. But what of your people spirits? Those who dread every step they take out their doors. There is a terrible monster out there preying on innocent folk, and if it doesn't kill us, its poison will. She knows they are afraid, but the Elementals allow us to call the Twelves Wood home, and even they quake with fear with this blasphemy's existence. To ignore them is to invite greater tragedy. But just because she is so focused on the Elementals, doesn't mean that she has forgotten about her people. By comforting the Elementals, we hope to enlist the help of the Great One in battling Glefnir. So for now, put their faith in the Guardians, and her. Well, they wish they could put a faith in her, but they have been dealing with death and sickness before Glefnir even existed. The people say the creeping death is nothing to fear, but one of theirs caught it not too long ago. They gave her the cure, and thought she'd be alright, but by the time they noticed something was wrong, it was too late to call for a conjurer. It was a sad day when she passed, none more so than her husband Supin. Supin? As in, Iesura Supin? No, Supin was an odd one, but not a padjol. Supin isn't even his real name, it's Elenja. But his wife always calls him Supin, so it caught on with the rest of the village. What did this Elenja look like? Well, he was around 30 years old. He kept to himself until he met his beloved. Then he became more friendly. His wife was always sickly, but she had fight and spirit. But spirit doesn't beat the creeping death. There was nothing they could do for her. So he did make himself a new life here. Thank you for recounting Elenja's story. It's sad, but it helps her to understand how much they suffered. They will have a reason to celebrate soon. Until then, put their faith in the elementals and her. Together they will overcome this crisis. The two Hearst Mill men look at each other, then back to Kane, and nod in agreement before leaving. Despite what they've said, it's most likely true that Elenja was Iesura Supin. To think that he was living here all this time, searching for a purpose, finding true love, to then be robbed of that fulfillment. If he wasn't stripped of his powers, could he have saved her? This question probably ate at him every night. Maybe in the end he blamed the Elementals for her death, and in his despair he was consumed. Then that animosity would linger and endure, until Glefnir would have its vengeance. We have done all we can here. Let's hope the Great One sees the purity in our intent. We head straight for the Guardian Tree. Our cleansing shouldn't have escaped the Great One's notice. Maybe we can have an audience. Kane begins to commune with the Great One. A bright blue aether radiates from her body. The aether changes its form into something stronger than it was before. It lifts Kane and her staff up into the air, and she starts to float in front of the tree. The Great One begins to speak through Kane. All feeling, passing corruption, refreshed, renewed green, Flesh restored, child of child, covenant honor, friendship, friend, peace. The corruption is but one aspect of a greater threat. Profanity spawn, despair orphan, sadness and anger, sadness, death's prayer, one in all, poison potent, wounds unmending, withering bark, no strength to share. After all we have done, he denies us. Kane is injured. She pledged herself to him, devoted her life to the Twelveswood. When the people cried out for salvation, she answered. When the Elementals cried out for salvation, she answered. Only he can help us, and if he doesn't, we are lost. She is lost. Please, I beg you. An unknown voice chimes in. We beg you. A group of people walk towards the Guardian Tree. There are people from everywhere we have helped in our mission. They have been depending on the Seed Seers their entire lives without ever doing anything for themselves. The Elder Seed Seer has gone to incredible lengths for her people, so the people have come to return the favor. If her plea is not enough, then they will raise their voice in support. They all want the same thing, peace restored to the forest. So please, share what he can, however little. 
Do not forsake us. Do not forsake her. Kane, covenant child, walks with man, with elemental, keeper of ancient faith, unbroken, cannot, will not, break faith to man, render up, flesh, branches, take and join to oldest elders, renew bond as one stir, raise up to heavens, covenant symbol, our staff, all join, all bloom, all peace. The Great One relinquishes his control over Kane. She falls over and is gasping for air. After she regains her composure, she announces that her duty weighed heavy on her heart. It is so heavy that she forgets to breathe. So many nights she worried that she would not be given the aid from the Great One, but the people's faith and trust has opened up a new path forward. They came and bared their hearts before the Great One. Gridania is forever in their debt. The Great One begins to give them five of his branches. They must take these branches to every corner of the Twelveswood and join them to the Eldest Tree. Once the trees are bound together in spirit, she will cast the Great One's cleansing power across all the Twelveswood. But be careful. Glefnis still lives. He lurks behind every tree, and he will not sit idle, and may even attempt to stop them. Go with hope in your heart, but don't lose sight of the danger. For a moment there, it looked like it wasn't going to work, but luckily with the help of the people, we ended up receiving the aid of the Guardian Tree. But the next step is actually quite complicated. Whilst the others bring the branches to the ancient trees in the Twelveswood, she will be reading the ancient texts and consulting the Seedseer Council to make sure everything goes well. Glefne won't go down peacefully. When he comes, we must be ready. Kane has sent word for us to return. We are now ready to strike at Glefnir. The children of the Twelves would have taken the branches to the far reaches of the forest. It is assumed to be a ceremony which expunges the corruption befouling the forest so that the earth may begin to mend. The last time the Ermine Hedge was formed, it protected the Twelves Wood. The Great One acted as a guardian and embraced the woods in its shield. On this occasion, we will use it to nourish and revitalize the forest. By channeling the power of the elementals, we can stop the spread of Glefnir's poison. At least that's what they interpreted, the Great One said. We actually learn a little bit about what an Ermine Hedge is in the 1.0 version of Final Fantasy XIV, specifically the quest named Shadow of the Raven. The Garleans, headed by Nail Von Darnus, are about to attack Redania, and the only way to survive the assault is to create an Ermine Hedge. It states that an Ermine Hedge is the most potent magical barrier known to Condry. It rises to the heavens whilst also stretching into the earth, protecting all within. Only the most gifted Condras can create one. Only after entering a prolonged state of meditation, they are wholly defenseless during the rite. If they come into harm whilst in this state, the bond with their wandering consciousness and their flesh is violently and irrevocably severed, leaving naught but an empty husk behind. So if the Seed Seer does intend to cast a spell like this, we must protect her at all costs. We have the final branch that must be attached to the eldest tree in the Twelveswood. She asks that we accept this honor. Who better to set the final stone in this new foundation for everlasting peace? She can count on us. We will find the tree in front of the Lever Workers Guild. Come, let us depart. Outside the guild there is a towering tree. In the bows above there is a spot where the bark has been discolored by age and elements. We must affix the branch there. We ascend the ancient trunk and place the branch of the guardian tree where Kane directed us. With that, all preparations are now complete. We departed for the guardian tree. Kane wants to appeal to Glefnir's reason. If she fails, we will have to fight. Today is the day we bid farewell to Glefnir. Through the branches of the Guardian Tree, the Twelves would become one. Summoning Ermine Hedge will imbue the lands with his nourishing aether. The forest will be empowered enough to heal itself, to break free from Glefnir's despair. The ceremony is complex and delicate. She hopes that we will do what is necessary to see that she isn't interrupted. The Keeper announces, Glefnir comes! Defend the Elder Seedseer! The hulking mass of muscle we saw before roars at us, before jumping and landing right in front of the tree. Kane tries to appeal to Glefnir. Are the elementals so deserving of his scorn? Does he hate her? Because she has horns. She knew a boy who called them gifts, symbols of the blessing he resolved to share with this world. Yet the beast before us brings nothing but misery and death. It marks his victims with chains to bind and condemn them, to share in its suffering. She wasn't there for him then, but she is here now, to unmake the creature he became. She will begin the ceremony. Stand fast and remember what we fight for. The battle against Glefnir begins. We must do all we can to keep Kane from getting interrupted. We defend her from an attack. But the poison. It starts to creep into our body. Courses through our veins. The battle rages on. The ceremony is almost complete. He calls upon his wicked minions to help him in battle. 
but we slay them and continue the fight. The barrier is so close, but Kane runs out of aether. The Keeper draws Glefnir's ire as we give Kane the remainder of our aether. After giving her our aether, we collapse to the floor. We are unable to resist the poison any longer, but she casts a spell just in time. Ermin's hedge has been erected. Anyone who stands inside this will be cleansed of the poison. The Keeper is wounded, but is healed by Kane. We continue to forge ahead. We cannot stop. Not here. Not now. In the face of death, Glefnir starts to get reckless and lashes out, but we do not go down. Eventually, Glefnir falls. He is defeated. The moment he falls, Kane starts to channel a spell. Through sacred soil and azure skies, may your compassion flow and swell to banish the darkness. She starts to spin her staff around as the ermine hedge starts to change shape. The outside barrier starts to have little glints of aether appearing around it. Then suddenly the barrier rushes outwards, throughout all of the Twelve's wood. The Great One speaks. Receding terror, blissful quiet, blessing, covenant preserved, now and always, child of child, honor and gratitude unending. Kane replies that their own honor and gratitude is unending. We wouldn't have one without its aid. In their everlasting grace, she prays that the Great One will continue to guide the children of the forest. In its boundless mercy, she prays that it will forgive the lost and forsaken who gave in to despair. A shimmering light appears around Glefnir's body. It seems that the Great One has forgiven Iesura. The body dissipates into rot. Kane promises that she will never forget his words of wisdom. Theirs is indeed a gift and a blessing, a duty to their people. She swears this until her final breath. The blight has been purged, and Glefnir has been slain. The sacred woods now breathes a sigh of relief. She must return to Gridania and continue her regular duties as a seed seer, but she wants to impose on us one final time. It won't be long. She wanted to meet us at the Lotus Stand. We speak to the guard out front and enter. The Great One's Aether flows throughout all of Twelveswood, purging the last of Glefnir's poison. The wounded are no longer in any danger, and have begun to recover. There is a lot to celebrate in no small part thanks to us. On behalf of Gridania, she thanks us for all of our effort in bringing down Glefnir. We went above and beyond for the sake of their people and their homeland. But with this crisis over, the Keeper would like to suggest a new course of action. Rest. A well-deserved one at that. Kane appreciates the concern, but she cannot, will not. One day, but not yet. Recent events have made her reflect on the past, lessons that she thought she took to heart. She didn't understand the duty which she was entrusted with, when those horns were chains binding her to a destiny she didn't choose. It was Iesura who taught her to appreciate the gift she was given. If not for him, where would she have gone instead? He was the first, but not the last. Countless other kind souls offered their words and support. This has helped her to continue to find a way forward, even when there wasn't one. From opening our hearts to one another, we create new paths to create brighter futures. All in Gridania are deserving of these gifts, so she will always be there for them, and together may they journey in safety through the darkness. Does she not desire a life outside of her duties, not tempted to live wild and free like an adventurer? She replies that it isn't without its appeal. She fondly remembers the occasions she has traveled far, like when she went with us to the churning mists. If there is ever a time she is no longer needed as the elder seeds here, she'd like to accompany us again. But regardless of what the future has in store for her, her current path is clear. So as long as the Padgil serve the bridge man and elemental, Gridania can weather any storm, and so she will continue to walk, hand in hand with her people and patrons, along a path that they will discover together. And that ends Endwalker's Tank Roll Quest. My thoughts on this roll quest is that I really like this part. I mean, I've never been too invested in the inner workings of the Twelveswood, but this has honestly offered such an interesting insight to it that now I crave more. Anytime I'm asked to look at 1.0 lore, I love it. So the fact that the Ermine Hedge was detailed in the 1.0 storyline means that I enjoyed researching it. Learning about the Padjo was fascinating. I am not entirely sure if they were mentioned in the game already, maybe in the Conjurer story quest, but as of right now I have not leveled a white mage. But then again just learning about how the Twelveswood works, from the elementals, the Hures, and the history of the two. Fantastic. 
If you are reading this for the first time, you don't even need any prior information about Gridania to understand what is happening, whilst also gaining an expansive knowledge about Gridania. Glefnir is a cool blasphemy, easily the best one in all the role quests. I love the design choice of taking a behemoth and covering it in chains and horns. Learning the tragic backstory of Iesura, who eventually became Glefnir, was quite sad. Life had thrown everything at him, but still he persevered, until he lost the one good thing in his life, his beloved. I love these little bite-sized stories. The main scenario is good enough if you want to know what's happening, but stuff like the role quests and the job quests expand the lore so much, giving just such a better perspective in the way beloved characters work and what is to come for said characters. As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this story down in the comments below. Again, if you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't give it a thumbs down, consider subscribing if you're interested in more Final Fantasy XIV lore content like this. If you want to talk to me outside of YouTube, I have a Twitter. I also have a Twitch that I don't use that often, but it exists. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed the video. Stay tuned for the next one. I'll see you all later. May you ever walk in the light of the crystal.